Bonjour, my bells and bats. My name is Sheena Peril. I am a novelist and knitwear designer. And if you are new here, thank you so much for stopping by. This is my monthly podcast where I talk about what I'm making, writing, reading, and we wrap up with a spooky tale at the end. And if you are a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. As you can probably tell, we have started getting our spring weather a little bit here in Washington. It was lovely and 70 yesterday in the morning. Um, and then it pulled in Ohio on me and we were actually in the hospital for a few hours yesterday. Um, my partner has MCAS and had an allergy reaction to unknown substance as happens with MCAS. And so we were in the ER for five hours. <laughs> so when we came out of the ER, it was 40 degrees and raining and windy and it was miserable and I was freezing. Um, but it is back to being nice and sunny today. Um, if you have seen my recent videos and vlogs, then you know that I haven't been doing too well lately. Um, I'm currently in medication roulette which means that my energy, my mood, and my physical well-being have been really up and down, um, mostly down, which is, which makes it very hard to concentrate and get anything done. Um, the one exception has been the lake effect pattern, which um, I designed at the end of March to raise funds for tornado relief. I have several family members who had a direct hit from a tornado back in March they're okay, but the area that they live in was devastated. So the funds from that pattern are going to the United Way to help with rebuilding and relief. The pattern is available on Ravelry and also on my Kofi shop um, for non-Ravelry users. And you can find updates on Kofi about our current situation, which hasn't been great here at Maison de Not Magic. On a better note, my latest book came out on Monday. Midnight Radio is still available for just 99 cents on Amazon and Kofi through the end of the month, and then it goes up to 4.99. Um, Midnight Radio is a series of spooky short stories set in a coal town in the 1950s. So if you are a fan of things like The Twilight Zone, HP Lovecraft, um, like cryptids and weirdness and that kind of thing, um, go check it out. I also have some samples available for you to read on my website, which is linked down below. So on to the FOs. My only finished objects this month were the two samples I made of the Lake Effect for the pattern release. Um, this is a color work pattern that I made from worsted weight yarn and the pattern includes information on the area and the specific landmark that inspired this pattern, which is the Sandy Beach Bridge at Russell's Point. So this is the original version, which uses three colors, um, but if you but you never use more than two at a time. For the second version, I only used two colors and I simplified the chart. Um, so this is a bridge over a bay at the lake. It is right across from the donut shop, which is best donuts in the area. Um, and this right here, there is a Christmas tree that is at the peak of the bridge in, during the holiday season. However, it doesn't always come down <laughs> on time. So it can be up there at any point in the year. And then we've also got the star on top. And then for the second version, I took out the tree but left the star. And if I were going to do a third version, I would move the star over into the space between the bridges. Um, but you know, hindsight 2020, all of that. Um, I used scraps and leftovers for both of these. So I don't know what all of the yarns are. For this one, I used uh, Broco Vintage for the blue, but I don't know the name of the color. Um, this green is a mixture of Stroll Tweed and Atlantis Heather and uh, Knit Picks Capretta and Hemlock Heather. It's two strands of Capretta and one strand of Stroll. 
Um, these are both fingering weight yarns, which is why I held three strands together in order to equal the worsted weight up here. Um, and then the white is just left over. I had a very small ball sitting in my stash, so I went ahead and used that up. And then for the black, this is a mystery acrylic. Um, and then for the color work, I have another mystery yarn that is teal and then two strands of Geektastic fibers in the color Saturday. Um, this is the same combination of colors that I used for my beret a few weeks ago. Um, I just had a little bit left over and so I used that here. I have quite a few whips this week, so let's get started. Um, the shawl I was working on was cursed. I ended up ripping it out six times, and at that point I decided that it, it's cursed, it's not destined to be a shawl. I still really wanted to use the yarns together though and get that fade. So I ripped it out and I cast on for a raglan sweater because I can knit a raglan in my sleep basically. Um, This is where we are so far. And the color progression is the same as it was for the shawl, but I did make a slight adjustment. So I started with quantum entang entanglements in Thalisa, but about halfway through the skein, I started blending out with dragonfly fibers in Damsel, just so that there would, wouldn't be a harsh line between the two, because they're very similar, but um, there's enough of a difference that it wouldn't have looked right, in my opinion, if I had just switched from one to the other. So I started striping it in here, and then down here is where we get to just the uh, dragonfly fibers, this section. And then from there, I transitioned into... Uh, Sweet Georgia Tough Love Sock in the color Water. Um, and I just did a couple of stripes to transition between these two just because there's more of a difference between them and it wasn't going to look weird. Um, I'm knitting until there's about 50 grams left and then um, I would do color transition um, and I'm leaving about 40 grams left on the ball so that I have enough to do the sleeves. Um, and then this bottom color right here, this is this is Brew City Yarns Lucky Charms in Mare in the Moon as the colorway. Um, so the first and last yarns both have Stellina in them, and then the two in the center don't. And these are all fingering weight yarn. They're all merino nylon blends. So I'm almost done with the body on this, and then I can start working on the sleeves. I was actually working on it while I waited for my camera to charge enough that I could start filming. And the Lucky Charms does have a lot of excess dye on it. This actually isn't too bad, but I only knit a row and a half. Um, when I've sat down to knit like six rows, then my hands have a lot more blue on them. Um, I haven't done much work on the rainbow sweater, but I did block the body. I will insert some footage here. The sweater had to be blocked before I could move on to the rest of the knitting, just because I need to know where to put in the armholes, how far down to go for the hood, and you might see stupid nipple in the middle of it. Um, that needed to go away. Um, so I decided to steam block it for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it's acrylic yarn, so it's hydrophobic and soaking just wouldn't do a whole lot of good the way it would for cotton or wool. Second, I don't have a place big enough to lay this out for an extended period while it dries. Um, so that's why I'm trying to do it on my bed in this footage. And also third, the heat is going to be more effective than water because of the fiber content. I am using an iron here. We do have a steamer, but that works best for things that are hanging or being blocked on a form. It doesn't work well for items laying flat just because of the direction it sends the steam, which could lead to burned, fin burned fingers. So I'm using a steam iron with a full reservoir 
normally for a synthetic, I would put it on the lowest setting, but because I'm using steam, I'm actually turning it up a little bit higher to the third setting, which is for blends. And you'll notice as I'm blocking, the iron doesn't actually touch the fabric. It's hovering about a quarter inch above it, and it's continually moving with constant steam to make sure I don't scorch or melt the sweater. And I'm starting by warming up that nipple in the center to make it more flexible and then pulling outward. As the fabric relaxes, I'm able to take up the slack and move my pins or combs further out. All in all, the sweater grew about four inches or about eight to nine centimeters through the process of blocking, which is absolutely fine by me. The nipple in the middle didn't go away completely, but it is a lot better than it was. And I think with wear and just the effects of gravity that that will take care of the rest of it. At least it'll be less noticeable. And once the sweater is done, I can always hang it in the shop hang it and then steam the center just to make any final adjustments. And because it was ste just steaming, um, it was dry and cool within a few minutes, so I could take it off the blocking mats, fold it up, and now it's ready for me to do the next step. I used two sets of blocking mats for this and a set of blocking combs, and links to all the supplies that I used are listed down below. While I've been working up the courage to cut into the knitting and start on the sleeves, I have been working on a couple of other things. I started on one of my top secret projects for Christmas. So these are some of the flower motifs I have completed using leftover yarns. And these are all unblocked. I haven't woven in any ends yet. And the black is worsted weight. It's just a mystery acrylic from the stash. And then the leftover yarns are all worsted weight. So they're either a worsted weight yarn or I've taken uh, multiple strands of fingering and held them together to equal worsted weight. I'm not gonna show this project much between now and when it's done or I give it to the recipient, um, but I have a lot more pieces like this that I need to make. Um, probably close to 100. So um, that's a work in progress. <laughs> it's going to be here a while. Along those same lines, my seldom acknowledged quilting book has been adding, acting up. Um, I had a bunch of small scraps left over from other projects, so I made a few small blocks that can be pieced together later. So this blue is from the dress that I made for the SCA a few um, last spring. And then uh, this is from a pair of pajama shorts that bit the dust. And these are all just backed on some leftover offcuts of muslin. Um, this black is from the chemise that I made to go with that dress, which you haven't seen yet. I just finished it. Um, and. I totally forgot to include that in my FOs. I will try to insert some footage of this. If not, you'll see it in the next podcast. So all I did was baste some of my scraps onto this muslin and I'm just kind of overlapping them and adding pieces as I go. And then once I have a fair number of these, I'll start piecing them together. And this is part of a bed sheet. I don't remember where exactly it came from. Um, and then I've started adding a little bit of like visible stitching and I'm gonna add some more embroidery to it. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. So those are the blocks I'm currently working on and where you see the muslin, I'm still looking for another fabric to add to that section. Um, but that is what I'm working on right now. And that is currently living in this basket, which I got from the thrift store for $4. This was originally a picnic basket and I took the styrofoam out of the inside where you'd put the cups and reattached the lining using a glue gun. And so that's what the inside of it looks like. And I'm just keeping all of my little sewing scraps in there for right now. Eventually it's gonna outgrow that basket, but for now it's fine. Okay, so 
my normal pick for sock yarn seems to be kind of galaxy themed, like lots of black and blue and purple and dark green. Um, but I just had the urge to cast on these socks. <laughs> um, the yarn is Hearthside Fibers Babu in 603010 Merino Bamboo Nylon, and the color is called Groovy. Um, I think I got this last year at Red Alder, but I'm not positive because it says it was dyed in Wisconsin, so I could be wrong about that. Um, so instead of socks that look like space, I have socks you can see from space. <laughs> Um, this is an improvised pattern. Um, like all of my sock patterns, I kind of based it off of Hermione's Everyday Socks. So it's a four stitch repeat, but in this case it repeats over four rows. So instead of a purl stitch, I just have a slipped stitch with the yarn carried in front. Um, and I thought that that would blend the colors really well and I like how it's coming out. Um, because I knew the with the slipped stitches it wouldn't be as stretchy. I did cast on 70 stitches instead of 60 so these are going to be a little bit looser but I think that they're still going to be like squishy and cozy and maybe just a little bit slouchy so I think that these are going to be really good. I also made them about an inch longer than I normally do just so they would work better with boots. Um, yesterday while we were at the ER, I was able to finish the heel flap and do the heel turn and I am ready now to pick up the stitches along the side for the gusset, but as you can see I'm on shorty needles and that gets a little bit fussy so I really didn't want to do that at the hospital. Now once I get past the gusset decreases, I am going down to my regular 60 stitches for the foot. Um, I might even go down a little bit further just because these needles are a US 2 or a 2.5 millimeter. Normally I make socks on a size 1, but I didn't have any shorty needles in a 1 and I didn't really feel like doing magic loop. So speaking of socks, we have the Eleonora stockings. And these made me cry. <laughs> so this is just not right. I need to do some decreases here before starting the three needle bind off to get a rounder heel. Um, there's also way too much fabric on the foot. So I need to decrease on these panels by about 25% before for here but there's also that increase right there for the gusset so not increase as much here maybe okay yeah either way the foot is too big but the photos are not clear enough for me to count individual stitches on the foot so I will have to look into that further, and that is a lot of ripping back. Ugh. So the way I fixed that is I ripped back and I started decreasing where my lifeline is right here, and that just gave the slightest curve to the heel. No, on me it still shows as being kind of pointy in the back of the foot, but um, because this is made for somebody with more of like a size 7 foot, it would fit a smaller heel better. So I think that that's fine. And then I did the same thing here. I did a three needle bind off along here because again, I didn't want to cut the yarn because I don't have that much left. And then did some decreases along the sole of the foot um, and brought it in. So now this is closer to a size seven. I can still get my foot in here, but it's a little bit snug, which is what I was looking for. Um, this particular stitch pattern isn't especially stretchy. It does have some stretch, but not a ton. I'm currently about halfway done with the foot. Um, and if this looks like an odd foot shape to you, number one it is. But also, I have tried it on. I can't get the stocking on all the way because I have larger calves than this. But I can get my foot in there 
And I think that once they were worn regularly, this bottom edge flattens out a bit. And then this kind of takes on a curve. And it is a little bit wrinkly around the top of the foot at the ankle, but it's not bad. Um, and again, these were kind of a novel construction at the time. We don't have any other stockings similar to this from the period. But these are the first evidence that we have of a pearl stitch. So there's a lot of stuff happening in these stockings that wasn't being done elsewhere that we know of. Um, and they're very clearly modeled off of woven stockings, just based on the construction of the fabric and the fact that they chose to do a seam under the heel. Um, I think the seam probably would have been grafted or just sewn together. But like I said, because I'm short on yarn, I really didn't want to be cutting into the yarn, especially if I had to rip back, which I did. So I went with a three needle bind off just because these are going to be for display only. Um, I can't wear them. They're too small for me. So what I'm going to do is get them framed and mounted so that they can be on display. This is also why if you are eagle eyed, you will notice that this cuff is the wrong way around. Um, and this is because This is because when I was looking at my reference photos, the leg of the stocking, if it's right side out or inside out, it looks pretty much the same in the photos. Um, so I didn't realize that I was referencing both stockings when I was working on this. I thought I was only referencing one. So I have the stocking from the inside out, uh, the cuff from the inside out stocking and then the leg from the right side out stocking. So um, I'm just saying that it's a design choice and because this specific one is going to be framed, that works out better because it's not gonna be significantly bulkier at the top than at the bottom. So it's gonna make it easier to put under glass. And as always, if you wanna know more about this project, why I'm doing it, the weird history and design aspects of it, they do have their own entire website, which you can find down below. I do have one more whip that didn't even make it onto my notes for the podcast. And that is, this is a Tunisian crocheted messenger bag I'm working on. Uh, so I'm knitting this using the leftovers from the rainbow sweater. Um, I still have one and a half of the big skeins of mandala left, one of the bonus bundles. The colorway is gnome. And so this is going to be the front and the side panels. It'll wrap around like this. I wanted it big enough for my laptop. And then when I get to the bottom, I'm going to uh, leave off about 10 stitches on each side and just work up the back uh, or the bottom and then the back and then the front flap and then um, add some straps to it. And I wanted to do Tunisian crochet for this because after I knit the, or sorry, after I crocheted the Wednesday vest with Tunisian, I really liked the fabric that I that it made. I think that it's really sturdy. It's not as stretchy as regular crochet or knitting, and you're less likely to have stuff poking through it. So I think this will make a really great bag. And I'm currently using a four millimeter. I think this is a US four. I could be wrong about that. It might be a five. I don't remember my conversions. Um, but I'm just using a four millimeter hook on this. <coughs> and I'm working on it slowly. I can't do a ton of Tunisian crochet in one sitting but I am really enjoying it and I've got a good start on it. It's about, about halfway done with the first panel. I just compared it to my laptop, so. Okay, and that is it for the whips. That was a lot of whips. It was a lot. 
Um, my only acquisition this time around is, where did it go? So I got uh, a package of three balls of sock yarn from the thrift store for $3.99. I got these like the day after I filmed the last episode. Um, these are three nearly full balls of yarn. I have one unlabeled, which I think is Croy, maybe. Um, and then I've got, let me just open these up. I kept them in the bag. Okay, so this one is acrylic. I've never heard of this company before. And this is really scratchy acrylic. This is not nice. It's premium quality knitting yarn. Strombe? I don't know where this came from. Made in China, but it's a bilingual package. English, Spanish, so that doesn't really tell me a whole lot. Um, uh, colorway is coal black. It feels like it's pretty old. Um, this one is probably not going to go into uh, anything nice. And this is the one that I think is Patton's Croy. It's clearly been used for something and then frogged and wound back up again. And then the last one is Plymouth Italian Collection Sakata. It's cotton, superwash wool, and nylon. This is the nicest one in the set. It was apparently $8.99 regular price, so I got pretty a pretty good deal on that. I don't have any plans for those yet, but when I find good knitting yarn at the thrift store, I go ahead and purchase it. Um, not doing that right now because I'm I'm not really trying to stash down. I'm just trying to curate the stash a little better. Okay, so that was the only acquisition. Um, so let's go on to watch, read, play. Um, like I said, I've been not doing so hot the last couple of months. I had about three weeks where all I really did was stare at the TV and I finished a lot of series I'd been working my way through. Um, it's okay to not be okay. Heaven's official blessing. Love is for suckers. I started watching season 10 of Murdoch Mysteries. I also started watching Cursed on Netflix. Um, so it's okay to not be okay. And Heaven's official blessing are both on Netflix where they were. Um, Heaven officials blessing has actually come off of Netflix since I watched it. One of the reasons I sat down was because it was marked as leaving soon and it was 10 30 minute episodes so it was one sitting. <laughs> it's okay to not be okay is a k-drama that deals a lot with mental health and it can be challenging to watch especially the first half of the series before you dig into the backstory of the main female character who could probably be classified as a psychopath at the beginning. Um, so if you've tried to watch that show and then gave up on it, just know that she was groomed to be that way and she does get better about halfway through. Um, a lot of the series is her learning how to be human and connect with people. Heaven Official's Blessing was just taken off Netflix, like I said, and it's a Chinese anime. I'm not sure what the proper name for that would be. Anime usually refers to Japanese animation, but I don't know if there's a specific term for Chinese animation. Um, but it's beautiful, funny. Um, it's 12 episodes, each are only about 10 minutes long. And by the time you take out the opening and closing, it's even shorter. So I binged it in one night. So this is actually based off of a novel. And while I did enjoy it a lot, I wasn't sure what was going on most of the time because they skipped a lot of stuff in the transition from book to TV. And there's some stuff that I'm not sure it was translated accurately. So it could be pretty confusing, but it is a lovely queer romance and very funny. 
um, Love is for Suckers is a K-drama about two platonic friends who both end up involved in a reality TV dating show for reasons I'm not going to get into now. Um, but it was very sweet and very enjoyable. And that one I watched on uh, Vicky, which is by Rakuten. Um, I also rewatched Birds of Prey and I saw Suicide Squad for the first time. Um, I'm going to stick to Birds of Prey because the starfish thing was traumatizing and I will not be watching it again, especially because I went to clean my glasses immediately after the movie opened up my desk drawer. This is a little silicone stress ball thing that I was given many years ago. That was, that, I forgot it was there. If you've seen the movie, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, if you have Hulu or Disney Plus, a new series dropped recently, which is called We Were the Lucky Ones. It's a World War II, dra two, World War II drama about a Jewish family in Poland. And it was really good. Um, it even had some really funny moments. But if you haven't watched it yet, it does end on kind of a cliffhanger for some of the characters. So be warned if you sit down and watch it. I don't know if they're planning a season two or not. It's hard to tell sometimes with Disney. Um, I also read two books. The first was on audio and it was The Scarlet Pimpernel, which I have tried to read a couple of times and failed. I can't say I like the book very much but it was recommended by an editor for a series of retellings that I've been wanting to write. Um, more about that in a later video. So I wanted to familiarize myself with the story and I can see the potential for rewriting that book to fit the series. But yeah, if I adapt it, there's going to be a lot of changes. <laughs> and the last book was an ebook from the library called Revolution which was about a French political prisoner during World War II. I first heard about this book in a video on Costube about the production of Rayon, which is how it got my interest. And I really love the author who was incredibly sarcastic, even in the face of death, especially in the face of death. And it's a combination of her diary from the start of the German invasion and her memories from that time, and then also things that she wrote down later after her incarceration, since she wasn't allowed to have a journal during that time. Um, it was heartbreaking and hard, but also wonderful and encouraging. And I wish she had, had included just a little bit more about her time post-war after she got, was liberated and able to go back to France. Um, because the book ends with her finding out that the next day she is going to be on a transport back to France but it doesn't actually show her being reunited with her friends or family or talk about what she did after the fact. And that has also been a lot. <laughs> um, I thought I wasn't going to have anything to talk about this week, which is one of the reasons why I put off podcasting. Um, but that was actually quite a bit. And next we have a new segment, a shop update. Um, down below, you are going to find a link to my Kofi shop which I've been slowly adding content to. Right now you can find some of my eBooks there. I'm in the process of updating files, which means that I'm reading through all of the documents, making slight changes to things like formatting, and then uploading new back matter, which is that section in the back with like the about the author stuff and all the links. So if you want an immediate download of the current version, you can find those on Gumroad or Amazon, also linked down below. Um, but I'm only putting the newest, shiniest versions up on Kofi, and then once they're up on Kofi, I'm uploading them everywhere else as well. Um, also available, there are some of my patterns, including the Lake Effect, Punk is Not Dead, and Pumpkin Head, among others. I'm slowly adding physical items as I'm able to get decent pictures of them. And one of the listings is for the Halloween face scrubbies that I made last fall. Okay, my ADHD brain has misplaced them. 
I have another set. I'm going to insert photos here because I can't find the like nice set that I had flattened out and everything to show you. Um, but I have two packs of those that are available or you can download the pattern in order to make them for yourself. Now let's turn down the lights, cozy up with a project and a drink, and let's move on to our spooky tale for tonight. We're doing the next installment of Know Your Cryptids in honor of the Midnight Radio release. The 1950s and 1960s saw so many UFO incidents, likely because so many people were already watching the skies. The high point of the Cold War, Americans were terrified that an atomic bomb like the ones released on Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be turned on them. There were many incidents of suspected flying saucers, flaming balls, or meteorites falling to earth, but today we're going to concentrate on three of them. The Flatwoods Monster, the Kecksburg UFO Incident, and the Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter. And I'm going to have links to a blog post that I did about this down below, which also has links to articles about these uh, incidents. These three cases are very similar, so I'm not going to go into detail on them. So check out the links if you want to know more. The first case, the Flatwoods Monster, was one of the big influences on Midnight Radio, in part because it is located almost in the exact middle of West Virginia, where the book is set. For my international readers, West Virginia is a mountainous state known for high strangeness. The entire Appalachia region in general is a bit weird, but that's another podcast. The reports are conflicting, as in most stories involving cryptids and the paranormal, but since I'm telling it, it goes like this. Mrs. May, a teacher turned hairdresser, either saw a ball of fire hit the earth or was drawn to it by her sons and their friends who were outside playing on the evening of September 12, 1952. Either Mrs. May thought she had witnessed a plane crash and went to offer aid because it was a very remote area, or the boys wanted to investigate a falling star and their mother insisted on going with them. Either way, Kathleen May, her sons, and their friends, so five to six children in total, reports Ferry, set off for a neighboring farm where the object landed. Along the way, they met up with 17-year-old Jean Lemon, a National Guardsman, who was also going to investigate. When they reached the hilltop, they found a huge monster with a pointed cowl around its head and bright red eyes. It was surrounded by a, quote, pungent mist, which made the investigators sick. At the sight of the creature, they all ran back to the May House, where they called the police and a reporter, A. Lee Stewart Jr. In some accounts, I've heard that they called him because he was a family friend, and in others, he's a journalist hunting for a story who comes in following the police. The police could find no sign of anything striking the hill on the neighbor's property, but Mrs. May and two of the kids had to be treated at a local hospital for symptoms, quote, similar to contact with mustard gas. The next day, Stuart returned to the hillside and came to find skid marks and a sticky substance on the ground. But police dismissed this as tire tracks and oil from a police car that was on the location the night before to investigate. In some versions, this is where the story ends, and in others, it continues. Several men in black suits driving black cars pulled up at the May household a few days later while the Stuart was present. Um, it, it appears that they were going over some of the photos he had taken and some of his notes for a story he was writing. The men did not identify themselves, but it was implied that they were with the government or military. They ordered the adults not to say anything about the incident, implying that there would be severe consequences for ignoring their warning. Stewart's notes and photos were taken away, and the men left after searching the house for more evidence. Almost three years later, on August 21st, 1955, a similar incident occurred in the neighboring state of Kentucky, between the towns of Kelly and Hopkinsville. A dozen people burst into the Hopkinsville police station, claiming that they had just been held captive at the Lankford home a few miles away by a spaceship and several waist-high aliens. The four families involved, the Lankfords, the Suttons, which were actually two brothers and their wives, the Taylors, and a bachelor named O.P. Baker, 
had been shooting at the, quote, small dark creatures for some four hours before they managed to escape. Concerned about the reports of shots fired, but believing the rest of the story to be the result of alcohol or another substance, police drove out to investigate. They found no evidence to support the claims other than bullet holes in the walls and the screen door. Before any further investigation could be made, the Lankfords packed up and abandoned the house early the next morning, claiming the creatures returned in the middle of the night. Our third incident occurred in 1965. On December 9th, a ball of light streaked across Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio before crashing into southwestern Pennsylvania. The ball of light was visible to at least six states, and along the route, residents reported falling metal debris, grass fires, and blue smoke. When the object finally landed, the Army and Air Force mobilized to find whatever it was, but reported coming up up empty-handed. The claims were, for obvious reasons, considered suspect by the general population. In 2005, NASA stated that the object was a Russian satellite breaking up on re-entry, but also that the files had been lost in the 1980s. Again, it seemed like more of a cover up than the actual truth, though a defective satellite crashing to Earth is a little bit more believable than the UFO theories. The stories of these strange creatures, soaring fireballs, and government cover-ups peppered the news from the end of World War II until the 1970s when they seemed to drop off, but the idea of spaceships crash landing in farm fields or remote wooded areas was one that has persisted up into the present day. Personally, I feel like UFO stories are some of the scariest out there. Humans are bad enough most of the time. I don't want to know what kinds of horrors other planets have come up with. And yes, this is exactly where Lily's fear of little green men comes from in Midnight Radio. What are your thoughts? Both the Flatwoods Monster and the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter have been attributed to, drumroll please, barn owl sightings. Do you think owls explain the shots fired or the mustard gas-like symptoms the witnesses suffered? Leave a comment down below and let me know. While you're there, please make sure to like and subscribe. Any interaction that you have with this video really helps me out. Until next time, please stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope that you have something cute and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao!